Welcome back to Making It Awkward. I'm your host, Jessica Wilson. Today's episode will be in two parts. Part one today is an interview, and in two weeks, we'll air an episode with response and feedback. The inspiration for this episode came from Whitney Trotter, who you met last week. It's an interview with Steve Dunn, a Texas lawyer whose daughter died from anorexia in 2016. He's recently sued IADEP over the organization's certification of who gets to call themselves an expert. Whitney collected questions from our colleagues for this interview, and you'll hear her getting answers today. If you're not familiar with IADEP, no problem. You can learn more about it in last week's episode about being Black in the eating disorder field. Now, his class action lawsuit against IADEP is on behalf of the plaintiff and the plaintiff class members, all who have gone through the certification process and are able to call themselves experts. From what I've been told by my colleagues, Steve was invested in filing the lawsuit and then just looking for people to sign on as plaintiffs. Bonnie Harkin, the managing director of IADEP, is the primary defendant. The lawsuit states that defendant Harkin's stewardship over IADEP has been marked by ethically questionable and illegal content. It goes on, The purpose of Defendant Harkin's illicit conduct was to unjustly enrich in herself at the expense of a nonprofit organization allegedly dedicated to the research, education, and understanding of eating disorders, end quote. The lawsuit also mentions the logistical and financial concerns Angela, Whitney, and I laid out in the previous episode and mentioned these as a, quote, unlawful tying agreement and violates antitrust laws, end quote. Seeks a return of all monies paid by the class members for IADEP certification. Seek the payment of attorney's fees, treble damages, exemplary damages, and for whatever other relief to which plaintiff and the plaintiff class are entitled, end quote. Now, Steve is not new to suing eating disorder organizations. He previously sued the National Eating Disorder Association after it merged with the Binge Eating Disorder Association. In a 2020 letter about that lawsuit, detailing his concerns and impetus for the lawsuit, he says he has been approached by a, quote, third party to investigate possible claims against the National Eating Disorder Association. The letter is 59 pages long, and ain't nobody got time to read all of that. From what I did read from the letter, Steve's lawsuit was about Nita claiming it would become more social justice oriented. I'm placing an asterisk here because in the follow-up episode, Megan, Whitney, and I could discuss whether the claims of social justice in Nita ever materialized. And if people have thoughts on this, let me know. Back to the letter. Steve in that letter states that, Nita has the absolute duty to third parties, its sponsors, financial supporters, and those from whom it seeks financial backing to disclose that it is pivoting to embrace social justice issues to the exclusion of evidence-based practices and medical treatment of eating disorders, end quote. And I'd like you all to notice the use of exclusion here. Additionally, Steve notes that Nita supported a 2020 letter from Trans Folks Fighting Eating Disorders titled An Open Letter to Eating Disorder Organizations and Institutions in response to statements published about diversity campaigns and solidarity with Black lives. Steve states that despite the fact that the letter is well-intentioned, the demands are not supported by any peer-reviewed material, is not supported by any scientific or research-based evidence, and would ultimately harm many people who suffer from eating disorders. (laughs) All right. I begin today's interview with Steve by asking about the Nita lawsuit to clarify his belief that integrating social justice will be at the expense of other people and to see how he views the BIPOC eating disorder conference. We then get deeper into the current lawsuit against IADEP. And with that, let's get into the interview. I decided to let it be played in full without cutting any tangential topics. You'll notice a couple of minor corrections that have been made in production, but otherwise it's all there. Dr. Trotter and Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I am so excited to introduce our guest. We'll be informal, but formally introduce him as Mr. Steve Dunn. And a little background, which we'll get into, you'll kind of share, but Jessica's podcast is Making It Awkward. And what better way for the three of us to start off this 2024 
I think uh, this podcast is going to break the ED world by storm. I don't think anybody had on their 2024 bingo card us interviewing you. But I'm excited because, and we'll get into this, I'm excited to interview you for a variety of reasons, but I've heard your name a lot. I'm originally from Austin, so I'm very connected still to the Austin, Dallas, ED community. But I've heard your name a lot in terms of Nita, and I, Jessica and I have been battling issues with IDEP for years. And so when I heard that you were kind of spearheading the IDEP lawsuit, I told Jessica, I said, we we have to get Steve on your podcast. And you agreed. And I'm so thankful for that. Well, it's a pleasure be, be, being here. And as far as I'm concerned, no topics are, are off, off the issue at all. So that's good. That's good. That makes it even better. So I'm going to take it back to Nita, and then we can bring us up to speed on IADEP. So I got to check out some of the letters that you've been able to write to other people in the field and organizations. In one of the written documents, there was a statement that I filed a class action lawsuit against Nita and its chief officers. When those officers began to change Nita's mission from an eating disorder organization to a social justice clown show. And I am wondering what you mean by social justice clown show. Okay, in this case, what these officers were doing is basically taking away the focus of this organization from the research and treatment and raising funds for eating disorders specifically. And they were beginning to turn it into a platform to get their own social justice views out there. In this case, that included things like supporting the Minnesota Soda Free Freedom Fund and other issues that really were not related to eating disorder, disorders at all. Now, I have no issue with that. As long as you tell the people who financially contribute to you that you're taking your organization in, in a new direction. They did not. For example, you look at Project Heal, for example. Mm -hmm. They absolutely did it the right way. When uh, Christina and Liana left, they changed the direction. And they were very upfront and loud and proud about we are going to embrace the social justice issues that legitimately exist. They put it out there. They told their donors that. And good for them. And as you may have seen, I've not written one negative thing about them since that change. And in fact, you know, I salute what they've done. I've had friends who have attended their ga ga galas the last few years in New York and say just great things about that. So it's more about being transparent with who you are and what you do and what you support. And Interesting, because in when I hear clown show, that doesn't that doesn't say transparency. That that says something different. When you take the emphasis away from an insidious illness that kills on average one person every 52 minutes. And that becomes not the primary focus, not the focus at all, but instead the, again, the platform for your views, then it's about balancing that. If it, and if it's a choice between saving lives right now versus hmm. what they were trying to do. Yeah. Okay. So I'm curious. So I'm, I'm on the board of Project Hill and I co-created the BIPOC eating disorder conference. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, do you, and I'm very outspoken um, about the issues of underrepresented identities in the landscape of eating disorders. Do you feel like, or are you concerned with the addition of social justice movement, social justice ideologies in the field of eating disorders? Yes and no. Okay. Tell me yes and tell me why yes. Tell me why no. Okay. We know what the issues are. We know what the problems are. Wait, what? so 
I think we may have a different, a shared difference here. So uh, briefly, can you tell us what you think the problems are? Sure. Under representation in research, under representation in the number of clinicians, under representation in uh, reaching out and finding the number of minorities impacted, including that in stu studies, in research, in treat uh, treatment, um, in my mind, there's no doubt that those are facts, that they exist. I mean, the, you know, those aren't allegations. We've seen again and again and again that those are real issues today that we need to find an intelligent, productive way to address. So we've got these issues, but what we don't have is real life solutions or recommendations how to address the inequities that do exist. No, that was helpful. Whitney had asked a yes or a no, and I just wanted to make sure that we had a shared understanding of what you think the the gaps are. So Whitney, sorry to interrupt your yes and your no. No, I think that was good. That was good. Yeah. So so you okay, so yes. So yes and no that you think there's a shared concern with addition of social justice in the eating disorder field. So can you tell us first yes, why, and then no? Because I'm really curious on, on both of your answers to this question. Okay, why there is a social justice component that should be include, included? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know, like I just said, you know, because of the under underrepresentation. And mm -hmm. as I understand it from the statistics I've seen, it's not a small amount, it's a huge amount. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, I have walked in the doors of a number of residential treatment centers and I look around and for the most part, I see thin, white, young pe people there. So we know that anorexia is much more prevalent amongst uh, whites and bulimia and binge eating disorders are much more prevalent in the, in the African American and Hispanic community communities. In addition, the treatment that's being given in these treatment centers today do not take into account the unique issues that arise in the minority communities. Mm -hmm. For example, you look at the clinicians in most of these places, and they tend to be liberal white women. Mm -hmm. You don't see a lot of African-American ther ther therapists in them. And in fact... I represented a, an African-American woman who was in a treatment center who was subjected to some pretty harassing treatment and remarks. Mm -hmm. and before we filed suit against this treatment center, we entered into me to mediation with them, and their conduct was so severe that they entered into a, se a settlement with us, and it was a pretty significant one. Mm -hmm. So um, I keep in touch with her. I you know, just, uh, this client of mine just, she's one of the ones I've had who have just continued to inspire me. Because you know, most people would say she checks every box. Uh, according to what the medical community says, she's, obese. So she had a B, BMI that's high. Uh, she had kids. She's a lesbian. And she's was diagnosed with binge eating and bulimia. So you combine all those, you've got to have a treatment professional who understands the combination of all of those. And in this case, not only did they not have that, but the conduct and action they did was just egregious. So we've got to be aware that the African-American, the Hispanic, the American Indian, whatever minority group it is, have their own unique issues that must be addressed. And so at the what same would time, your no be? If okay. That's the and yes. at, at the same time, the, the no's we've seen, and it has been written to me by some activists that we need to 
Um, stop relying on the medical community because they don't know everything. We should be exclusively listening to lived experience. And to me, that's just, you know, I believe the medical community, and by that I mean the doctors. I don't mean the pharmaceutical companies at all. And I don't mean the doctors whose strings are being controlled by the private equity firms out there. But there are some good doctors and some incredible research doctors as well that are making some incredible breakthroughs right now. But there is some, there was some language out there that we just need to ignore them. We need to exclusively listen to um, the lived experience. And then you go back to uh, about a year and a half ago, um, and you take the case of Lindo Bay. Bacon, are you too aware of what she they, went through? And um, you know, she they was wait. I just want to correct you. I believe their their pronouns they them. Yes, they them. Yes, yes, yes. And they she was the largest advocate that the ASDAH had for Hayes. They her books on it. They was going to write another book. They she wanted some collaboration. But it came across that they wanted free collaboration to get them to do their work. And the Hayes community and the ASDAH just threw, threw them in a very pu uh, public, eviscerated way. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Bacon and I, I, I don't agree with a lot of their views, but the way that they was ostracized. Uh-huh. I think has hurt the Hayes movement so dramatically. And it's gone now exclusively. If you go onto the ASDAH website, mm -hmm. look, it almost seems like you know, they're focusing on the, and I don't know what term of art you wish to use, women in larger, African-American women in larger bodies and no, and no one else is what, welcome. Oh, um, so that's that's what you read when when you see that. Uh, when I combine it with their actions, uh -huh. when I combine it with how they have approached things, when I combine it with they haven't been willing to collaborate or respond for requests to collaborate, that is the lens that I am seeing their involvement through now. I do agree with many of the points of Hayes. We uh -huh. absolutely got to get away from B B B A A A M I. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But um, we've so got to find a system that healthcare providers and insurance companies will embrace as being a more objective measurement of health. And we know it's not B BMI, but until we can come up with something that's more accurate, mm -hmm. then we're stuck with the old ways, of course. Yeah. All right. I'm going to wrap us around. Whitney, go ahead. Yes. Okay. So I just, I want to back up and, and do a clarifying one. I think that's amazing that you get to so freely walk into residential treatment centers. I think I'm on a do not enter list from a lot of them. Yeah. Um, but... Okay. <laughs> I I do want to do a clarifying mark of what you said as a clinician. Um, yes, when we go into residential treatment centers, we see a lot of thin white people, white women, non-binary. The the reason why if if somebody is walking into and you might see what you said more African Americans bulimia and binge eating disorder, it's not. And research is flawed in this, and it's skewed. I as a clinician, I actually treat more black people with anorexia. But we cannot, because of what you just said, what you said, BMI wise, I can't get them into residential treatment center. And so when we see from a diagnostic factor, when you have, depending on how you practice, and if you're allowed into these treatment centers, or if treatment centers will even respond back to you, um, we, we have this skewed perception, especially among black women in the South, as you're in Dallas, I'm in Memphis now, that more black women have binge eating disorder. And I, I just want to highlight on this that that is true. We, we know, however, 
we do have a lot, especially black youth. We have so many black youth that are struggling with anorexia nervosa and we cannot get them into treatment centers. And, and I, so I, I really want to emphasize that on here because the research that NIDA continues to put out is from 2011 of 50% of youth, black youth having bulimia. And it's just, it's so outdated, but I just wanted to say that mm -hmm. I won't elaborate on the haze because that's not what we're here to talk about. But so I did want to kind of segue us to kind of our next question, because I, I know the listeners are really they're eager to hear a lot about Ida. So I just for folks who might say this, um, I want to make sure that uh, we're clear that we don't know that black women and black people have more binge eating disorder and bulimia. That is what the research has been about. There is less than 0.1%. Um, of the eating disorder research that even mentions um, anorexia. So we don't know, uh, which is another reason that people may say don't rely on the data because the data is not telling us what is actually the truth. We don't know because sure. it's not out there. So that's why lived experience becomes really important. I am wondering from what you discussed as far as the not relying on science in the BIPOC eating disorder conference, for me, that would say it's a social justice clown show because we are talking a lot about lived experience and how a lot of that is missing in the research. What is your question? Do you think the, the BIPOC eating disorder conference would be a social justice clown show? Nope, I don't. Okay. Not and then- all. And yeah. in, in fact, if I can address one thing, one, the last settlement offer we made to uh -huh. I, I, I adept uh -huh. was in addition to everything else, they were to make a $25,000 donation to this upcoming year's Bi Bi BIPOC con conference. Okay. Really? I was unaware of that. So that's mm -hmm. good news to me as the creator. Hey, 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 I want this on record. I'm gonna send you a sponsorship letter now, Steve. Okay, for the 2024 conference. Are you sure if I'm a so you know if I'm a so associate associated with that, they might burn the pl place down now. So hey, that's okay. We will take the green money so that I can adequately pay people for their work. So well, and you know, and I can tell you what, Wes. Well, when we resolve the need need a case. We had their insurance company uh, pay, I think it was 25000 to Cindy Bulick's EDGY research study and another, I think, 10000 to I I I NC. So okay. if in the event we resolve the IADEP case, we're going to make sure that donations are made. One of the people I rep I represent as well is very, very much is insisting, and I'm on board with it, that the BIPOC conference is included and that we get some funds to them to help. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. I obviously that's music to my ears. And um and one of the questions you already answered, so I'm glad we don't have to spend time on that. One of the questions that somebody did write in was do you plan on reinvesting the money? And so it sounds like you all do plan on reinvesting the money if you all do garner money from this. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I think that is incredibly important. And you, you two are probably aware of the petition that is out there calling for Ms. Harkin to resign and for cer certification to be taken away. Um, that petition is up to 175 I saw that last night. I saw that Which last night. Which I, you know, I, I was not consulted on the petition. I did not contribute. I didn't revise it. And quite frankly, if I had been asked, I would say, don't do it. Because if you only have 10 to 15 folks that signed this thing, that is going to you know, get them more entrenched. They're going to hold this up and say, this is proof that we don't do a bad job. But when you have 175 people sign, that is, for this type of petition, a significant amount. Since you brought up Ida, let's kind of get into that. Can you, sure. I'm curious, like what, can you kind of summarize for us and the listeners, what led you to pursue litigation, the lawsuit against Ida? Kind of give us like a, a summary, so to speak, for those. And um, out there that may be familiar with IADEP and who are not, who are in the ED field, but not members of IADEP. People know that IADEP, they basically do the cert certification. And after that, the crickets start. What the heck do they do? So when people first approached me, I thought, okay, just 
work it out. Besides this cert, this certification, they don't do anything. The local chapter, for example, here, um, pretty much exists just to perpetuate its own existence. They have an event or two. They bring someone in to talk to them a few times in the year. It's a you know it's a little group and. Other people in the community with who I have spoken with, one of them even said, you know, Steve, they're a young, they're a you know, mom and pop organization, don't waste your time. So, and, you know, that doesn't, that did not come from me. That came from someone really well connected in the community. So it's like, fine, I'm not going to waste my time. But then more and more people began to come to me. And they said, look at the certification program. Look how expensive it is. And I began to take a look. <laughs> and then I found out that at their symposium in California this past year, allegedly, not allegedly, they had sent a photo of me to the hotel saying, this guy is Steve Dunn. He's likely to disrupt this conference. So if he shows up, immediately escort him off. I hadn't said a thing about IADEP in an aggressive, overt way prior to that. So I was I was interested where that came from. But as I looked into it, I began to see the inequities that existed. I looked at how all the chapters were set up, and it came down to Basically, this or this organization is being run by uh, Bonnie Harkin out of Illinois. There's no transition plan in place. I had a number of people tell me if you disagree with her, she's going to find a way to get you out. So based upon all that, I did some research into the antitrust laws and I saw, holy cow, there is an issue here. And so many people. People now want to make the certification more inclusive, more objective, less exp expensive. So based upon that, had a client sign up. My initial role was to send a let letter to Ms. Harkin, pointing out all of the inconsistencies, including that a number of chapters were not in good standing at that time. And even the IADEP, the National IADEP Foundation, was not in good standing in the state of California where it is organized. So I pointed all these things out and said, I would welcome an opportunity to sit down and talk with you. And let's bring some third parties in to see how we fix this. And the response was, and maybe was it the right response or not? I don't know. She law lawyered up, heard from an attorney. Uh, about a week after that, the attorneys wrote back, said, thank you, Mr. Dunn, for the information. You're right. We're fixing things in California. We're fixing this with, she represented that she had a corporation that was the managing director of IADEP. That corporation has been defunct since 2016. And yet in all their tax filings, it's still being represented as in existence. Mm -hmm. And then I started a foundation, my daughter's name in 2017. I let it lapse in 2020. Mm -hmm. And the attorneys tried to say, you pointing out I adepts, missteps is the same as you doing the foundation for your Daughter. Of course, with my daughter's foundation, it's not an operation. It's not accepting any donations. It has not in years. It was closed down. And in my mind, for them to try to equate the two was not respecting my daughter or what she stood for. So just as in the NIDA case, I gave them a few more opportunities, including, you know, a final demand. You know, Ms. Harkin has to leave. The uh, chapters are, you know, you, uh, the national chapter contributes a certain amount to all of the individual chapters who then find a way to affiliate, to appoint a committee, to clean up the mess, to redo the 
certification process. And then we had funds going to the BIPOC conference and others as well. We Wait, you have it. funds if you win, because we haven't re well, we did have some funds from individual chapters. Is that what you're referencing? No, no. It was in the last demand we made before I filed oh, the so okay. that a number of demands were made. Okay. It, gotcha. it was responded to by zero. Nothing at all. So we fought, filed the suit. Since we filed the suit, I have found some other things that are very concerning about them, including Ms. Harkin is defining herself as an independent contract, which means there are no paid in full time employees of IADEP at all. An independent contractor has to be independent. The, or, the organization can't have any say-so or control over how they do their work. Well, that's one thing that I do not believe will fly. And even if she is an independent contractor, when you have a California organization like IADEP is, and you conduct work at, in the state of California like they do, it's irrelevant that an independent contractor is out of state. Taxes are owed to the state of California. It's like when a pro athlete goes out and plays against the Lakers or the Rams out there, the athletes from out of state still have to pay taxes to that state. Mm -hmm. That has not been done. Ever. Is your issue more so with IDEP of how Bonnie is running the organization or do you feel like it is the, the main central issue is this the certification and the membership process or both and either or? It's both. Okay. You know, it's I believe it's it's long past time for her to move on. And if if I so wish a few years ago she would have seen the writing on the wall, entered into a transition plan, and she would have left a respected, beloved member of the community community you know at and you know age is shouldn't be an issue but she's 80 years old now, and there's no transition plan in place mm -hmm. there's nobody who has been you know appointed even nominally to replace her and on all the corporate chapters throughout the united states you know i counted you know 35 or or, or some more she is on the board of directors of each and every one. And the board of directors is what controls organi organizations. It's not the uh, officers. The boards have the ultimate say-so in the direction, the mission, the vi vision. To the extent that um, Ms. Har you had to get Ms. Harkin's approval to even use the IADEP logo, as I understand it, on some of the chapters fundraising activities and events that sort of thing so okay. it's it's really a combination of her and the certification process needs to be changed right so you're saying this organization should be changed she should step down and change the certification yes okay i'm Super interested in that certification piece. Um, I think you've mentioned you've been doing your research, so you may or may not have come across Megan Saichi's work and other folks, yes, who have um, pointed out the gatekeeping in the certification process, right? It costs a lot of money or basically locked in. I'm interested. What do you think the certification should be well that's a good question and since i am not, i i would just have to give an answer from the outside of course you know because i'm not you know i don't have the background that that you two have of course sure but this is a prime example if we're going to start to be more inclusive uh-huh for african americans for hispanics for uh native Americans for any minority, mm -hmm. you offer them a lower, a substantially lower fees, Got it. certification fees, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. If you want to start to include them, mm -hmm. you make it financially so 
you know, you give financial incentives so they can get involved. In addition, you've got to have some minority representation to bring these issues to the attention of the overall board. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't have that. You know, I have to say, I regret, because that sounds like, I, and I'm not accusing you of this, that sounds like verbatim of things that I posted on Instagram. And I regret some of that because I think what is happening, and I and I, and I know it was not um, ill intention on your part, but I think what is happening when I used to say things like that are people are taking it as every underrepresented clinician cannot afford the certification process as is, because that seems to be the sticking point. And it is the certification process, if you are in private practice, I don't think anyone racially can can afford this, regardless of racial, ethnic, religious, cultural demographics, because it's so cost prohibitive. Agreed. So I guess my question is, and and I forgive me for being frustrated, Jessica and I have been saying these exact things, you know, because Jessica was my my first call 2020 uh, when I was thinking about that. And I had every qualification to get, you know, they had the grant. I think December 31st, 2020 was the last day to get grandfathered in. But I think my frustration now is you've got two black clinicians in the ED field that combined have been in EDs I, probably two decades. Easy. Why, what is it about you delivering this lawsuit versus us saying this, that people are finally paying attention? What, why do you think that is? Good question. What, that they're paying attention now because the lawsuit's on the books or? Yeah, yes and no. Yes and no. But like, what is it like? I, I, cause what I, and you correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm understanding you say is you really haven't been involved with IADEP. You knew of it. But somebody approached you to kind of deliver these ultimatums to Bonnie. Now, obviously, you're the right person career wise because you're a lawyer. But there's so many people that have been raising the alarm for, uh, against IDEP. And, and quite frankly, there's been a lot of clinicians that have left IDEP um, and have chosen not to recertify. I'm just so curious, why at the end of 2023 did Steve Dunn, why were people like, OK, we finally have a way out of this? Versus when 2020, when we started this whole process and we're trying to garner support, people didn't listen to us then. So why why do you think that is people are rallying behind you? And now we've got 175 signatures on this petition. Well, you know, I don't know so much if it's rallying behind me. I think it's rallying behind what's going on. And it's not about me that's making this change. It's the fact that the legal system is involved me. If I wasn't able to get the legal system involved, it would be, you know, don't, who cares about that screwy bow tie turdy whose da da daughter died down there? Texas, he's a grieving wa wacko dad. And I've heard those things before. But the fact that I'm able to get the legal system involved and mm -hmm. to have that system decide, is this a wrong? And if it is, how do we write this? wrong when you hit people that way when you hit them in you know financially in the pocketbook that's what brings about change and in this case we have to keep in mind that IADEP has um insurance in place i don't know how much yet but they have insurance in place so the funds to either pay any type of judgment or a, sell a settlement will initially come from insurance. Now, let's say if they only have a million uh, in insurance in place and a judgment is for five million, let's say, then collecting the four million against IADAP and Ms. Harkin, that's not going to occur, of course, unless Ms. Harkin owns a, a tropical island somewhere or a private jet or something like that, which we know she does not. But it's it's more involving something far great far greater than me, and that's the legal system. So I think that's why people are paying more attention now. And again, it's hard to go into and see all the wrongs that have been done unless you know exactly where to research of course, and what to look for. And fortunately, you know, 40 years as an attorney has kind of trained me to do exactly that.
this has been my number one question. I'm curious if you could kind of tell listeners, I've always been curious, where does the money go? And you correct me if I'm wrong here. To my understanding, our conference is one of the few ED conferences where we actually compensate speakers. Mm -hmm. And so all the money that is accrued from the membership from the certification process, IADEP has, to my knowledge, has not paid speakers or comped travel or helped with, um, for example, our speakers are paid and they get free registration, right? So my question is the way that IADEP is set up, you mentioned there's a national org and there's individual chapters. Where is all that money going to that people are putting into this organization? If you look at their Form 990 tax returns, I wish I had pulled up in front of me. I don't. It lists pretty much every, it gives you a breakdown of where the funds go. Um, we, we do know that Bonnie Harkin pays herself. Last year was a salary of $156,000. Mm-hmm. She I pays her son about, it was listed as 74000 I pointed that out. But they threw a conniption fit about that and filed an amended return. And he's being paid fifty-eight thousand. There's about thirty-five thousand in credit card bills, expenses. I believe those were incurred by Miss Harkin. So you combine those three numbers, it's up to about two hundred and forty thousand. And then you look at the amounts, of course. Yeah, you know, if we're looking at net numbers, you've got to take into account the amounts that are paid to the hotels that have the conference, of course, but we don't know for sure. And the reason why we don't know for sure, because because for the last 10 years, Ms. Harkin has refused to have an independent third party audited financial statement done. I understand at the Ida Board of Directors meetings that take place, she is the one who delivers information about the finances of the entity. Now, they have a reputable uh, CPA firm in St. Louis who files their tax filings, but those are only as good as the information they get. Mm -hmm. Until, that's another demand we made, that there absolutely has to be an independent third-party financial statement done for the last five years, and it's got to be transparent so we all know where the funds go. So just summarize for our listeners out there, we actually don't know where where the money is because that was my perception when I looked at the IRS. Now, granted, I'm not an accountant, but I think that's really important transparency. So I think that's good. Of We actually don't know where the money is going that everybody is paying into. And that's one thing we hope the lawsuit will reveal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. There are a number of, of goals we have from the law the lawsuit one of course is, is to have miss harkin removed two to have either first to have a reputable committee of people to be appointed i have no idea who to oversee um the certification to look how we can improve it to make donations to causes like the bipoc conference and others as well and to get transparency, where have the funds gone in the last four to five years? And if there was any inappropriate conduct, and I'm not saying there is, and I'm not implying there is, but if there was, that needs to be addressed. I do have another question. Sorry, Jessica. I, why do you want to keep the certification process? Like, Yeah, why? and the organization. <laughs> well... I think ultimately the certification process will be sent to one of the two entities that oversee other certifications for other aspects of mental health. And sure. now, but why? Why do you? Why do you? I think uh, yes, you're not attacking the substance of the certification, even correct. though. Well, I just I just don't know enough about it to give an intelligent. Opinion. Got it. So this lawsuit is not about that. Correct. Got okay. it. Okay. So that makes- whatever changes need to be made, and they're Got obviously do. I'm I'm not the guy to ask. You know, it's it's people like you, experts like you guys, who can say uh, this needs to change, and we need to include this, and the fees need to be changed. You know, that's that's not what this is about. Got it. It's about the money and tax and stuff like that. Okay. 
So there's opportunity, but this is not that. And if the certification process improves and it really becomes representative of an expert and more people are included who should be, you know, then it could actually stand for something. And, you know, keep in mind, insurance companies are now sometimes requiring one person who is cert certified to be in a treatment center or even a non-private equity owned one. Insurance companies are beginning to make that demand. No, I haven't heard that. Now, can yeah, you know? I've heard it's been like threatened as a reason for us to yeah. get it, but I've never actually seen it in practice. I've got a good friend who owns a treatment center in Bur in Birmingham, Alabama. It's a standalone one. She's a really good friend. I've spoken with her about it. She uh, in the past she has sued Blue Cross Blue Shield down there. I you know, I admire her quite a bit. Um, she initially gave me that information. Um, I confirmed that with others in a private equity owned treatment center, and they confirmed it as well. I do not believe it's widespread, but it's it's here. Okay, so we can email you later for those follow-up treatment centers. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. What will happen? This is another question that we had from um, some folks is what's going to happen as a result of the lawsuit with the individual chapters? You know, that's, I have communicated at least four or five times with the presidents of about 29 of the independent chapters. And I have emphasized to them that they're not at risk. I'm not going after them. I don't want to. I don't think they are. They have any liability. Um, I believe they're going to have to find some way to become more involved and more re relevant. I know in the past month, the St. Louis chapter is dissolving. The Los Angeles ch chapter is dissolving. The New Haven one has and the Phoenix one, I believe, is in the process of as well. The St. Louis chapter is spinning a little bit to cover other aspects of eating disorders and make it more a locally focused one where the money that goes into it stays in that community up there. Now, I don't know specifically um, what it's going to go towards, and I'd be more than happy to send information about the people I've spoken to out there who, who can perhaps give you that. But I believe the in, independent chapters need to find their own identity. What's important for the, you know, if certification is being taken care of by a reputable organization, that's what they do. Then these individual chapters, I believe, will need to find how can we help the most number of families and people who are afflicted. Okay, this is my last question. I, this is the one that I I wanted to ask. Like, I, I, there's so many, but do you think I was telling Jessica when we think about this? You know, grief manifests in so many different ways for people, and you and I, you know, talked briefly about that through email, both having lost um, children. Yes. Do you think that you have a reputation amongst people in the eating disorder field? I, I know some people admire and like me, and some people are passing around a Stephen Dunn vo voodoo doll. I know sometimes I do not clearly articulate perhaps what views I have, and I don't always put the long game out there. For example, on this terminal anorexia thing, I was going after Jen Gotti Ani with nuclear bombs, and I was yeah. filing med complaints, state board med complaints against mm -hmm. her. We met face to face at I said in June in D.C. and had a chance to talk. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that came the retraction of the They Terminate article, an apology from her, an apology from me. A lot of people don't know that we met in Denver on November 17th with about 25 other people to talk about this. And in fact, this past weekend, I had a great friendly chat with uh Jen on the phone. We talked about our families and life and terminal anorexia and everything else. And from an attacking, you know, I'm going to, you know, nuke you into obliv oblivion. 
has come a fr friendship. And trust is being developed now as well. And I didn't know for sure that that's how things would go. I did it that way in the past with the treatment center and the people who run it. And now we are friends as well and we col collaborate on things. So people don't often see the long game because I don't always put it out there. And at times I don't see completely what that long game is. So reputation is, is you know, last thing I'll say on this is uh, when I sued Nita, I had a doctor in San Antonio say, Steve, I don't think you're going to like this. I don't think your legacy is going to be what you think it is. And my reply was, there's some goofy Star Trek film. But in this film, there was a quote. And that quote was, a man can only be a man. He shouldn't try to be a great man. History will make its own ju judgments. And so I can only do what I can do. And some people will like it and some won't. And how I'm either remembered or not. Other people than myself will decide that, and I'm okay with that. I can tell you, though, and I've, I've said this before, anybody who feels like they have been hurt by me or disagree with me, pick up the phone and call, and I can guarantee you that I will treat you with respect as a professional. It, our communications will not be argumentative. They'll not be in your face but I will listen respectfully and believe it or not, some I like to say I was wrong because when a person says I was wrong, that means they've learned something new. They've learned something different. They've expanded their minds and perhaps their hearts as well. And the people who have taken that risk, who have reached out, I think have found that. Okay. I think it's a good place to end it. I will thank you very much for your time. It seems like we could do this again. There's so much we haven't even discussed. I <laughs> would love to. Absolutely. And yeah, there's, there's, and each month something new comes up, it seems like. So if you ever want to do this again, I'm just a phone call away. Yeah, well, it seems I like to see my sponsorship letter in your inbox. <laughs> <laughs> I will look for that. I absolutely will. I think it's a great idea. I am very excited. So once again, thank you for your time. Whitney, do you have any closing? No, thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to part two, three, and probably four. I like that as well. I myself have lots to say about this conversation. There are many questions I would have asked had we not run out of time. Luckily, Steve offered to chat anytime in case we feel called. Whitney and I will bring on Megan Saichi to discuss this episode in two weeks. You heard that Megan was the one who initially added up the total cost of IADEP certification. Megan is the dietitian who truly heard what Whitney and I were saying about IADEP and started the conversation among white dietitians to not renew their certification. The three of us would love your feedback for that episode. It will be recorded on Monday, January 22nd. You can send thoughts, comments, and any constructive criticism you might have to makingitawkwardpod at gmail.com. You can submit it by Sunday, the 21st. After this, you can still send it through that Thursday, the 25th, and I'll try to include it with the intro or outro of this episode. Again, you can email or send a voice memo to makingitawkwardpod at gmail.com. Side note, I got an alert that an account named Bonnie Harkin followed me on Instagram and the podcast on YouTube, so there's a chance that she'll be listening to what you have to share as well. Lastly, in addition to the lawsuit, you heard a couple segues, one into Health at Every Size and Lindo Bacon, and another into terminal anorexia. These are both big topics with deep histories that deserve their own episodes perhaps many episodes. I have planned to talk about health at every size since the inception of this podcast. I think it will be a deeper episode knowing now that Lindo approached Steve about their concerns. If Dr. Jen Gaudiani has time in the future, I'd love to have her on to talk about terminal anorexia. You can find an article about it that discusses some of what Steve was referring to in the show notes. Until next time, keep asking the questions and don't be afraid to make things awkward.
You can now support the show by donating to its Patreon information in the show notes. My co-host for this interview was Dr. Whitney Trotter. This has been Making It Awkward with me, your host, Jessica Wilson, and is a production of The Body Politic. It's supported by the legacy of Sacramento Outboard Services and then edited and mixed by the fantastical Jen Jacobs. 